a short but dramatic segment of the Niagara Escarpment serves as a backdrop to the town of Milton, Ontario, today's destination. Here, the sheer cliff face runs from Rattlesnake Point at the south of the Massif to Kelso at the north, and we can clearly see its extraordinary geological features. The hard cap rock is really, really old, more than 400 million years in fact, laid down over softer shale in ancient seas. In the shadow of the escarpment, visitors to the conservation areas can enjoy all manner of activities, from rock climbing to swimming. Welcome to Escapes with Nigel. I'm Nigel Napier Andrews, and today we're at the Country Heritage Park to see what real horsepower means. Heavy Horse Field Days is an annual gathering. It's at the site of the former Ontario Agricultural Museum, now run by volunteers and a small staff who care for the 30 heritage farm and rural buildings on the 80-acre site with enthusiasm and dedication. Today, heavy draft horses show how farming was done in pioneer days before the advent of mechanization. The first date in a farmer's calendar was to prepare the fields, and at this demonstration at the Ontario Heritage Park, the heavy clay soil grudgingly gives way to the horse plough and disc. Carrie Doyle is a farrier and farmer who's taken on a non-traditional role on the farm. Carrie, you're about halfway through ploughing this field with this wonderful team of horses and this, and this incredible plough, but how does this compare with the really, really old days and what people do today? In the old days, they actually had a walking plow where they walked behind it. This was the next step up in, in plows and then to the tractor after this. And is this hard to get a straight furrow? I Very. mean, I see, I see you doing a pretty good job with a straight line. Does this take a lot of practice? It does. Your team has to work together and every little mistake they make, it shows up in your furrow. And you're, you're an actual farmer and a farrier, so yes. we would expect these horses to have perfect pedicures. <laughs> I wish, I wish it could be that way, yes. Or is it like the shoemaker's, shoemaker's daughter? Yep, very much so. Or the mechanic's so. uh, truck? Yep. The farrier's horses have the worst hooves on the planet. Well, not the worst, but... Not the worst, but... Okay. Yeah, I noticed that they've got no shoes on them, so they don't need shoes... No. ...for the sort of work they're doing in this field. Right. Now, tell me a little bit about how you, as a woman, got into this very, seeming to me, as an observer, male-oriented business, both of ploughing and being a farrier. Um, the farrier aspect came in, I had a riding horse and my farrier was a woman and when I finished university I was between jobs and she said well why don't you do this and I said well if you can I can. Okay. So that's how I did the farrier thing and then the plowing um, I got these horses given to me actually and uh, so I started learning about working with the heavies and I enjoy being able to be out working with them. So Carrie there's a lovely piece of equipment that you're using today. And um, how, old, how old would this be? It's about 80 years old. And so this would be on the transition from the old plow that you actually walk behind into the age of the tractor? Yes. And do you prefer to have a horse-drawn plow to a tractor plow? Um, yeah. It's quieter. It's more environmentally friendly. Is it, is it really peaceful going behind these great beautiful yes. beasts and, and just doing your thing straight up and down? Yeah. Well, we're going to let you get on with it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Jim Barton is a retired businessman whose love of heavy horses has brought him here today. I saw you out earlier in the field and I guess you're going to get back to work in a while with Carrie. She was ploughing, but what were you doing? I didn't recognize that implement at all. We're disking the ploughed ground that she had ploughed. And what does that do? It breaks the lumps up further to make it prepare it more for the seed bed. Right. And did people have to do that in the old days because of the way the plough worked, or do they still do that? They still somewhat do that. They right. still disc as well, and right. then cultivate to make a to make a proper seed bed, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in conventional tillage. And these are all normal, natural steps that people have been doing for hundreds of years or thousands of years, just with different sorts of equipment. Pretty much. Yes. Pretty much. So you're going to walk behind these two lovely guys and control them from the back. 
How does all that work? Well, I'll have a seat on the disc that I'll drive from, and then I'll drive from these driving lines here right. that operate these lines here to, to the bits in their mouth that mm -hmm. turn them either way that I want them to go or stop them. Okay. And when I walk, and to walk behind them, you walk on a, on a, like with the spring teeth, the next item we may use is we'll just walk, there'll be no seat, but they'll still be drove from the lines. Well, listen, I'm gonna let you get back to work, and I'm gonna go and see how things work at the other end of the beast. Very good, thank you. Tony Wallbank is a farmer and heavy horse enthusiast. We have 25 acres near Woodstock, Ontario, and we plow and disc and harrow and all those good things with a team of horses. And I noticed that this is not a matching pair. Is that important or is that just for vanity? No, it's not important. Vanity comes into play when you have exactly the same four white legs on a horse and, and uh, they're showier. Yeah. And what breed are these? These are called Perchin horses and they came from France. Uh, they started bringing heavy horses into Canada and America in about 1880 and the very first Perchin horse came to Air, Ontario in 1882. And is that the forefather of these actual horses? That's right, that's right. And they brought horses right through until World War I and then they had to stop of course and then they brought them again into the 1920s and that's when the tractors started to compete with the horses. So Tony, we're giving the horses a break in the shade and you've been out in the field for a while and uh, tell me what this machine does. Well, this is a grain binder and basically it cuts the oats in the field and it takes the sheaths of oats up through the canvases. These are right. rolling and belts. It's squished in between here, is it? That's right. Okay, it goes and up like this. That's right. And then it gathers it over here uh -huh. and makes the actual sheaths. I'll pick one up and show you. Okay. And it also takes a string and it knots this sheath. And in a few days, they would take these bundles and put them onto a wagon. Right. And then they would put them through the thrashing machine. And it would thrash out the oats, which are used to feed the horses. There would be straw. And then the, these weed seeds would come out separate. Okay. And they would bundle them up and usually burn them. This machine came into being in about 1880, 1890, and uh, before that, they used to use a reaper which wouldn't knot the sheaths. And before that, in the olden days, they would use a sigh and they would sigh the oats and gather them in by hand. So this was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This particular machine uh, was built in 1910 and it's been going ever since. Now we've been looking for the warranty card for it because there's a few parts starting to wear and we want to see if they're <laughs> still under warranty. What I find absolutely fascinating is that this is just the most amazing collection of gears and wheels and nuts and bolts, and it's just all driven by horsepower. That's right. There's a bull wheel underneath this machine, a large wheel, and it drives all the pulleys and the gears, uh, and away it goes and does its thing. The thing that I'm most fascinated in is how it makes a little knot, and I want to know, is it a proper knot or is it a granny knot? It's a proper knot, Oops. yeah. So it it actually loops it around and makes a regular knot, and this same knot is used, and the knotter system is still used on modern farm equipment today. Thank you very much, Tony. You're welcome. Thank you. After the work on the farm is completed the farmer and his family enjoyed a jaunt into town in carriages and carts. Today, visitors can enjoy wagon rides through the village. In several displays, all kinds of horse-drawn equipment have been preserved. In the busy smithy, the farrier, Mike Smith, is hard at work. So you're taking this little shoe off. I am. And then you're gonna We're trim gonna his feet down. Take the shoe off. We're gonna trim the extra foot. Right. And then when we go inside, we'll uh, we'll make some new shoes, shall we? We're gonna so, make you make a shoe. Well, that'll be interesting. That's something I've never done before. And I, I know of course that horseshoes are uh, supposed to be good luck. They so are. So I can make my own good luck today. 
<laughs> oh, that's his friend over the road. Somebody told me your last name is Smith. Is that right? It is. So you're actually Mike the Blacksmith Smith? I am. That's how it all started. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. I mean, you were really fated to be a blacksmith, weren't it's, you? It seemed that way, didn't it? Yeah. And how long have you been doing this? Uh, about 10 years now. Yeah? Yeah. Well, he's being very patient with us today, isn't he? He is. He's a good kid. I would love it if they were all so patient. Yeah. But obviously, these uh, hooves are just like our nails. They grow continuously. Absolutely. And... Uh, I guess they don't wear down because they've got a shoe on. No, but so, uh, if we had no shoe on, they'd wear down too fast with the work they do. Right. So we put a shoe to protect, but then every six to eight weeks, you need to come back, pull that shoe off, even if it's not the shoe worn out. Right. Because the growth is still there. They're growing and they can't grind anything down with how they're working. And you just shoe them on the front? I do. A lot of horses will be shod just in front. Front end bears more weight than the back end. Okay. And it does a different job with how a horse is built. So a lot of the time we need to protect the front before the back end. If they were working harder, we would have them on all four. Right. Can I see that up here, please? See how Absolutely. big it is? Absolutely. Okay, but I thought we were going to make one like this. Well, like I said, you're going you're gonna to start small. Oh. That's please. a sort of comparison with uh, Jerry's little foot and a uh, big draft horse that we might see later. We're going to make a horseshoe. We're going to start off small, something a little bit nice so and easy. So why don't you show me how you do it, and then I'll sort of try and make one as well. There's marks right here. Yeah. See the little center punch mark in the I center do. there? Yeah. That's the first nail hole and the last nail hole. Okay. First thing you're always going to do when steel comes out of that fire, yeah. this is a nice block brush, you're going to brush away. You'll okay. see me do it every time. Okay. The scale that comes off of this steel is what it's we want to get rid of. It's still hot. Wow, it is hot. So, I can feel it. I'm going to hold the very end down here. Yes. Into my leg a little bit. I'm going to use the round side of the hammer. There's a round side and a flat side. And I'm going to knock that corner in. See how I folded that yeah. corner in? Yeah. I'm going to knock that corner in and then flat. So you're going to come with your tongue right there. Here I am. Yep. Come with my tongue. Come on out. Okay. Bring it here. Yes. You're going to have to hold that, okay? That's okay. your hand. There's your brush. Okay, and I'm going to... Away from you. Yep, perfect. Stop. Stop. The hammer's going to hold it. You loosen on your tong. Right. Loosen that so that that can come to the end. Right. And hit in there. You're going to stand where I was standing. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Come back to me a little bit. Yes. That in there. And That's hit it. That's going to come like that. Okay. And give it a little hit. Yep, and just get into it. yourself. You should feel it push on you. Well, I think I've got the banging the red hot metal part of it. I'm not sure what shape I'm making. Am I making a horrible mess of it? Uh, not yet. Let me see for a second. Mike, through the magic of television, we're now going to cut forward to where I make a complete horseshoe. Take the next step. Right. I love how fast you're working, Mike. You lose 75 degrees a second. So that's ah. half a horseshoe. Mike, you know what? I ra now recognize in the face of the absolute professional that I'm so happy you let me hit the horseshoe with a hammer, but that's <laughs> all I'm capable of doing. Now, I've heard the expression cherry heat. Is that what this is? This right is, now is just a little bit more than cherry heat. Cherry heat is that red right okay. in there. Okay, good. But because he grew more toe than heel, I actually use the heat as part of the trim. So it's a little bit warmer at the front. Right. And that makes it fit perfectly, does it? It makes a nice, perfect connection between that shoe and his foot. David Natris oversees the park's daily operations. 
David, how many acres are here at the Country Heritage Park? Uh, Nigel, we've got 80 acres. And is... all these wonderful sheds full of marvelous treasures from olden days. We've yes. got over 20,000 artifacts here. We've got 20, about 160 antique tractors right. and uh, all kinds of things like these thrash machines right. and so on. And this yeah. beautiful 50s tractor as well. That's right. Something for everybody. Something for everybody. Well, let's go and look one. at these guys. Okay. Well, this building is just full of the most wonderful treasures of, of the farming age. Uh, it, it sort of really represents, I guess, the transition from the horse world to the mechanized world. In a sense, it does. This is a, what we call our thrash machine barn, and it has thrash machines that were built from anywhere in the 1880s up until the 1940s when they stopped making thrash machines and they were taken over by combines. But the early thrash machines, they did have actual horsepower. They had machines that uh, the horse would be on a tread wheel or turning a circle and uh, would turn a mechanism that would make the thrash machine work. But uh, today it's, it's tractors and combines that have taken over. And I notice outside you've actually got a thrashing machine because we, uh, we, right. we've seen that working today. Is that one of these? That's one of these machines. Uh, we've got about five outside that we have out for the summer. And they'll be put back in here. And uh, the one you saw today was a McCormick Daring that uh, uh, goes back into, that one was probably built in the 1930s and uh, gave us a good demonstration of how you uh, thrash wheat. And I see you have some tractors in here? We do. And the ones you see here are a collection of international harvester tractors that uh, represent about the 1950s. And uh, down further to the east of us, you'll find a barn that has everything from the original old oil poles which uh, were the original two-cylinder engine tractors that started and then into the gasoline tractors and so on from about the 1920s up until the 1950s. You've got a fantastic facility here at the Country Heritage Park. What sort of things do you do here throughout the year? But one of the things we try to do is use the facility as an education center. We've got two complete farmsteads here representing the 1830s and the early 1900s. And we've got five different types of barn, barn styles. We've got a schoolhouse, we've got a blacksmith shop, we've got an harness shop, we've got Women's Institute building. We've got over 30 buildings here. So it really represents a crossroads community and the history of farming in rural Ontario uh, from the late 1800s up until today. And these are all yeah. authentic buildings that were moved to this they site? They were all moved to this site and from different locations throughout Ontario. And today is Heavy Horse Day, and that happens annually? That happens annually. And what happened to the horses when the tractor took over? Did the horse population diminish for a Not while? Not immediately. Uh, the horses were kept on farms right up until the 1950s, and today many of the Mennonite families still use horses throughout the Elmira area, for example. Uh, my own personal recollection of horses was that uh, we had horses on our farm until 1949. Uh, I remember riding on the seed drill while my dad uh, seeded the field with a team of horses in front of us. Our neighbors had their horses up until the late 1950s. So they were still utilized for some of the smaller implements and uh, machines that were a little more difficult for tractors to handle. And today we've seen great teams of Percherons doing all sorts of jobs just like they did in the old days. That's right. Yeah. It's wonderful that those skills have survived. It has and it's and still carried on. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for joining us today at the Heavy Horse Days at the Country Heritage Park in Milton. For more information, please check out the website, and don't forget to visit my website for all sorts of extras about the show. We'll see you next time on Escapes with Nigel. Okay, I think it's my turn to drive, isn't it? It is. Let's see if we can get this right. Okay, giddy up. And is it half a right or left? G. G. That's it, G.